pieces of cockroach to this. So, you know, you have one single database and you simply keep adding nodes to it and you're expanding it, not just from a volume point of view from the size of the database itself, but from transactional volume as well. You can hit any one of these nodes and it's going to act like a single logical database, right? Interesting enough, we can actually deploy these things in multiple different regions as well or across multiple different clusters, which is actually really cool. So what looks like one single logical database actually underneath the covers is implemented across multiple different regions so I can survive things a bit and whatnot, right? So number one, um, a couple of cool things about Cockroach, I'm going to go five quick things and then Keith is going to go and do operator and demo and stuff. Number one, we uh, this is standard SQL. We aren't requiring you to learn anything else. We are wire compatible with Postgres. So if you know SQL, you can interact with CockroachDB. Number two, you could ask any node uh, in a cluster for data, and it will find that, that data throughout the cluster. Um, every node is a single consistent gateway to the entirety of the database. This is what allows us to be kind of one single logical database. I could ask any, any, any node, and I'm going to find that data. Number three, I, you know, in this in this first question, I well, I was asking uh, for this record, and it was in region one. It's got to go all the way over to Europe and back. That's not efficient. How do we geolocate data near users to reduce read-write latencies? And how can the database do that? Cockroach has a very unique capability called geopartitioning that allows us to actually do that. So now, when this user Spencer Campbell asks for his data. Well, it's actually located in Europe. Say he's in he's in Europe, right? And so we can actually geolocate data and geopartition data, which is actually pretty unique and allows us to deal with these latency issues at global scale. Finally, I, I talked about scale. Simply spin up a node, point it at the cluster, and what happens is Cockroach will consume that new node and balance all of the data throughout the cluster so that we can balance for you know, volume of transactions or, or volume of data, whatever it is. There is no manual sharding involved. And then finally, when a node fails or even a whole region, um, what we've done is we've actually created replicas of data so that the data still exists and you still have access to this. The, the, the cluster itself would actually remedy this situation, actually deal with these sort of things in terms of create a, you know, a third copy of that data somewhere else, but we can actually you know, survive failure of, of a node or complete region, right? So that's the high level overview of CockroachDB in just a couple slides. And, Oh gosh, I did it. Man, we're 10 minutes in, Keith. I did it in about eight or nine minutes. So, um, but I wanted to get into a demo of Cockroach TV and getting started. So Keith, do you want to take over here? Yeah, absolutely. So, so we're going to demo. Can you, Hey Keith, really quickly, just let me, just let me remind everybody, please do ask questions in the QA. I will be monitoring the QA for questions along the way and dump those into Keith. I just wanted to remind everybody. Sorry, Keith, go on. No problem. So yeah. I, I'm going to demonstrate two things today. I'm going to demonstrate using our operator to set up a Cockroach DB cluster in a single region. Uh, in this case, it's going to be a, um, an open shift environment that's running on my laptop. And then later on, we're going to um, be working on a distributed environment that I set up previously that's across three regions in, in Google Cloud. So uh, and I think I'm running that on GKE. So um, I'm going to go ahead and kind of share the, the first bit. So hopefully you can uh, see my, my screen, Jim. So yeah. what, what we have here is OpenShift. If you're not familiar with OpenShift, it's Red Hat's Kubernetes distribution, right? Um, we have published the CockroachDB operator in their operator hub, which makes it super easy to get started with, with CockroachDB. So um, all I need to do is search for the operator. We got the Cockroach operator right here. Um, I'm gonna click on the install button. I'm gonna install it into my CockroachDB namespace that I created a couple of minutes ago. And, and that's going to go ahead and actually install the operator on the cluster. Now, for while I'm waiting for this to install, I'm going to talk a little bit about what an operator is. So an operator is a, um, cust is a manager for a custom resource in Kubernetes. So we define a custom resource called a CRDB cluster. And then the operator is, is a pod, actually, that, um, that we assign state to, we, we publish um, custom resources to, and it configures and maintains the database for us. So it does things like um, easy rolling upgrades. Um, it's going to make it easier in the future to, to set up backups and restores and 
um, do auto scaling and all that kind of stuff. Um, right now, it's um, it's doing a full install and and upgrades for us, um, which is um, not super hard in Kubernetes. We we got we got away with not having an operator for a long time. But what it's really designed to do is make some of those kind of day two operations, like post install operations, easy to manage in production. So, so we have this operator. Um, it provides a CockroachDB cluster API. I can kind of I can click on the link to create a um, create a cluster. Um, and the back end, it's creating a CR. We're going to be um, um, we're going to name the CR CRDB TLS example. Um, it's going to have um, TLS enabled, so it's going to be an encrypted. Um, it's going to be set up with encryption. Um, it's going to we're going to spin up three nodes in this OpenShift environment, and each of them are going to have 10 gigs of storage. So we're going to go ahead and, and create this real quick. Um, and over the next 90 seconds or so, um, it's going to um, it's going to install the database for us. So. That's it. That's all you need to do to get CockroachDB up and running. If you're running not in OpenShift, um, we have published instructions on our website on how to use the operator. We also have a published Helm chart that you can use for, you know, that's more for test and dev type environments. Uh, also super easy. Um, we also, for custom deployments, which is something we're going to talk about a little bit later, um, um, we do also publish stateful set configurations for publishing for installing CockroachDB manually against Kubernetes. Um, right now, because the operator is, is currently um, single region, is a single region operator, um, you would still use the stateful sets for deploying across multiple um, data centers, which, I, which I've done here um, for the later demo. Um, let's see if it's created my resources yet. It has. So I have, um, it's starting to create my, my database pods. So um, we'll go ahead and, and let it finish starting up. We're gonna, we have three more that are gonna need to start. You can see in the logs that it's already kind of coming up and, and going. Um, let's go ahead and see if we have, we're almost, the, the database is almost live and healthy. We got just one more pod that needs to come up. Hey, Keith, really quickly while we're waiting for that to come up, um, you know, we're showing the operator via, you know, you know OpenShift in the marketplace. Um, it's also available just raw in our, Git rep in our Git repo as well, right? Yes, absolutely. So we have, a, this is open source, so this is published. Um, hold on a second, I'm gonna log in into the database and create a quick user and then we're going to log into the admin GUI to prove I didn't just like kind of fake it. So okay. Still love watching your tie, buddy. Uh, so much this fun. is the only part I couldn't <laughs> script. <laughs> I know. Here we go. SQL shell. All right, standard, so standard um, it's pretty super standard SQL. So I'm gonna go ahead and do um, localhost because I am. I did a quick port forward. It logs me in. Um, I have three nodes that are running. Um, you can see that all of these are running uh, kind of locally on my laptop right That's now. That's right. Um, and, and Keith, you did localhost into one of the pods, right? One of the instances of Cockroach, right? It could have been any one of those instances, correct? And then you would get the DB console? That, that is absolutely correct. Yeah. yeah. We don't implement like a separate node to do the console and then database. It's everything is like a distributed system, same, single binary. Every single node implements the same binary, right? So. Right. Everything is a, sim, a, a single binary, um, which makes it really easy to, to kind of work with this stuff, which is awesome. Yeah. And it, and easy to scale and, and aligned with the core principles of kind of distributed systems and how these things work, right? So 
Um, real quickly, there was a question about Rancher as well. You know, could we use this with Rancher? I don't think we're in the Rancher marketplace yet, right, Keith? But I mean, the operator would work with the instance. I mean, with the yeah. So, right? um, so we do work. We work with any Kubernetes distribution. Um, you know, we we're not necessarily listed in every single marketplace, but our generic Kubernetes instructions. Um, I have yet to find a Kubernetes distribution that um, that didn't work. Um, right. so, so really it's a matter of, of kind of just following the instructions in our documentation. Right. Yeah, exactly. So, um, and that is another question too. We, you know, I think we're in this install, we're definitely using stateful sets. Um, are we, I mean, is there an option to do this a different way, Keith, or is that just kind of like the standard way of doing things? Um, so stateful sets sets are the the standard way of doing things we could theoretically um use something like um daemon sets uh, and there's certain right. use cases for daemon sets um but generally speaking daemon sets are more appropriate for things like a log stash agent or whatnot where you want it to run in every single node whereas for us we would have to, to use taints in the background to make sure that the right. database only landed on on specific nodes that's right. Yeah, and I mean, ultimately, stateful sets is helping a lot, especially with the concept of a database, right? I mean, you, there is a fair amount that actually goes into what we're using stateful sets for, right? So it's, it's actually a critical piece of the whole thing. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and then, uh, did, oh, uh, there was also a question about OpenID, and do we support OpenID Connect Protocol? So, um, so OpenID is would maybe be appropriate for the admin UI. Um, I am not aware of us specifically having supported that single sign-on mechanism. Right. right now, our, our auth authorization me mechanisms are password, user and password, um, um, TLS certificate authentication, and, um, and then GSS API, which would be um, backed up by like a like a Kerberos based sure. infrastructure like Active Directory. Yeah. Um, we we have discussed and we've done this for Cockroach Cloud, which is our kind of managed service and um, for um, databases of service um, where you do have single sign-on. So theoretically, we could make that available and self-hosted as well. Right. Um, I don't think we current publish currently publish the the tooling that would be required to do that, but it it would be feasible. Um, right. I, I hope cool. that answers the question. Yeah, I think so, Keith. And then um, one more, you know, is this the preferred method of installing and running Cockroach? Um, you know, using the operator. I mean, I know we've had a Helm chart as well. Like, and so I think I see you just using the operator now um, over Helm. Like, what is your preferred approach? Because we use either, right? Yeah, we can use either. Um, so for production deployments, I still recommend the, the static configs. Um, so largely because there's always something custom that you need to do and the operator is pretty new. I mean, I think you're aware right. we, we announced it um, in, the autumn, in the fall, right? So it's, we're still, um, you know, we're still kind of um, working to, to make sure that it has full full right. feature coverage that we need there. The Helm chart is great for, for like super simple test and dev environments. You certainly could use that in production, but certain administrative tasks are a little bit more complicated using Helm. Right. Um, I don't think there's a wrong, I don't think there's a bad way to install CockroachDB on, on uh, Kubernetes. The, I think the, generally speaking, it's gonna be really hard to, to to really mess things up for yourself. Um, right. the, the, the Helm chart is, is very flexible for, for a basic install. Um, yeah. the, and then the stateful sets are super dynamic for when you have custom networking and, and all the, the kinds right. of things that go into that. Yeah, and you know, somebody was asking about, you know, how do you persist data? You know, is it just PV and what are you doing? And, and I think that's all kind of covered. I think you you kind of spoke to that, Keith, but stateful sets is really that key thing so that when things do fail, the persistent storage and remounting that to whatever pod that is 
um, it's just a key piece of the overall equation. It's part of what, you know, because we can actually survive loss of a piece of data within the database, we can lose a pod pretty easily and, and survive that pretty well. You're going to show that in the next demo, right? Yeah. In the, in the distributed demo across multiple data centers, I'm going to show that. So yeah. um, it's a little easier here because of the GUI to show off some of the stuff that's in, right. that we're actually doing. So we're mounting um, secrets as a volume. Right. Um, and we're also mounting a persistent volume claim, right. a PV into, um, into the cluster. Right. Um, and each node gets its own volume, right? So it's, yep. um, and that way, if we lose a node or we lose a pod, we can recover from that very easily. Yep. And so one last thing before we move on, Keith, and I just wanted to comment, there was a, I, I'm trying to hit the questions live, y'all, like uh, there's, there's a lot of questions here, which is really fantastic. So forgive me if I'm not repeating the question, I am paraphrasing and kind of lobbying them into Keith here. Um, I just wanted to talk to a couple of things. Our operator is, somebody was asking if it's open source or not. Our operator is definitely open source. The Git repo is out there. I'll get it out to everybody. Um, I'll, as Keith is doing this, I'll, I'll go look it up and get the link to that. Um, it is written in Go, um, yeah. uh, which is which is kind of unique to, I mean, well, I mean, unique to us, actually. We, our entire database is written in Go, so it's pretty well aligned um, kind of with, with kind of how these things come together. So, um, dude, there are a lot of really, really deep questions here, Keith. I'm going to let I'm going to I'm going to do the second half of the presentation just to talk about how we scale and how we survive things and then we'll get you back into the the demo um, while Keith kind of sets things up I'm going to go back into the uh, screen sharing here y'all okay uh, let me see where is this guy okay uh, Keith can you see my the, the share yes okay great awesome so um, we, we showed you how to kind of deal with installation and the operator and whatnot. Um, you know, underneath the covers, what, what Cockroach implements and what we use and we rely on pretty heavily is a, a, a distributed consensus protocol called Raft. Now, if you're not familiar with Raft, uh, go check it out. I mean, if you're interested in distributed systems, Raft and Paxos, um, really interesting, cool stuff. Um, and we use Raft uh, uh, to, to a major extent. I think I think I heard, and it's it's not easy to actually get done and do well um, within within a distributed system. I think I think I heard Ben Darnell, who's one of our founders, is probably one of the best software engineers I've ever met in my life, say, "Hey, I could have probably coded Raft in a couple of days when I was in college, but to do it for a distributed, like production grade database, it's taken years to get this right because." we're dealing with some really interesting challenges when it comes to a database. And, and when you start dealing with Raft and distributed consensus at, 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 at major scale across you know, different parts of the planet, there's lots of different things that go into that. And there's been a lot of really interesting software engineering from you know, the Cockroach Labs engineering team to actually fix some really interesting things uh, that, that we found in Raft that, that we, you know, we actually contribute to upstream etcd. And there was a question here about split brain and some of these things. Actually, we've architected out some of those those really really difficult problems to deal with, uh, you know, around you know atomic replication and whatnot. And so um, there's lots of stuff on our blog. I'm not going to get too deep into the the particulars of what we've done here, but you know, the same kind of core concepts that are driving Kubernetes and you know Raft and etcd are the same concepts that are here in Cockroach, and we share a lot of that same lineage. And we actually contribute upstream to these other things. So. I know there was a question about split brain. I, man, that's a really, really deep question. There's definitely a great blog post about how we've actually dealt with that um, in Cockroach. Um, I think, you know, there's been some recent issues about split brain and distributed consensus and this is a whole other world. But, but we use Raft. Um, there's a Raft group in Cockroach. A uh, Raft group basically is, you know, replicas of data um, and a leaseholder or a Raft leader where basically most transactions will concern, um, will, 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 will commit. Um, when we actually place data within a cluster, somebody was actually asking this in the uh, in the chat. You know, how do you uh, how do you distribute data? I have four nodes, and I actually want to take a table and distribute replicas of the ranges uh, within this table. Ultimately, underneath the covers in Cockroach, every table is broken down into 256 megabit chunks of data. Um, and so, what that allows us to do is move data around and create these replica sets. Um, and so you can imagine this table, which is dog names here. Um, you know, we're writing, you know, ranges of this data. You can think of these as just shards, but we automate all of that chart. I'm going to show you that, right? And so 
Um, but when we write data to a cluster, we can, we can optimize this for different failure domains or basically for latency. Uh, but we can actually survive lots of different things. When we write the first range, we write three nodes, we write the second range, the right the third range. And, and what we're doing is we're distributing data evenly across these various different nodes. We can also do things, we use heuristics in the database itself so that when load is heavy on a particular range, we can actually segment that range out to its own node or its own pod, if you will, so that it can actually you know, deal with that transactional volume of what that is, right? So um, another way in which we can actually deal with the, the, the placement of data is to optimize the overall performance of the cluster. Now we can also do something really cool. And if you, at a deep, deeper layer, there is you know, the architectural deep dive of Cockroach. If you're really interested in how this stuff works, uh, we go into a great explanation of how this works. It, there's, it's in our YouTube channel if you, if you really want after it. But we can actually overload the primary key uh, for each of the tables and actually uh, integrate in, uh, say, a location so that we can actually control where data is going to be placed in a cluster as well. Um, and so there's lots of different things we can do here. This is a unique capability to Cockroach. Um, it's called geo partitioning. I believe, Keith, you are going to show a little bit of geo partitioning in the demo, right? Yeah, we're going to use yeah. geopartitioning across three data centers in the in the U.S. as a part yeah. of the demo. And so, you know, ultimately at Cockroach, look at there. There are two primitives of which we've defined for, and, and which we designed and implemented for. Number one is consistency of data. So, you know, we've implemented a database that is true system of record. So, serializable isolation. So, data is guaranteed correct in our database. This isn't eventually consistent. You're, what you read is what you're going to get, right? And that's and, and when we've optimized for that, and there's a lot of things we had to do in distributed systems to actually deal with that, right? And so there's these challenges to the CAT theorem. I think there've been a couple of questions about that. And we could talk about that in a little bit. Um, but we've also optimized for the speed of light. That's our biggest competitor. How do we actually guarantee a transaction um, and then give low latency access to data and no matter where people are on the planet, which is also really, really difficult to do for it. And, and so we've done a lot of those, those, those things. When we add replicas or we add a node to a cluster, what it's doing is just simply moving replicas around and rebalancing the cluster. Um, we can actually survive failure. Um, say node three goes down, those two replicas are gone. The database is smart enough to heal that. It's gonna create you know, the other replicas. It's always gonna be available. So um, real quick kind of overview, I just wanted to give a little breather so Keith can go into the second half of the demo. Keith, it's all you Great. about. So, can you see my screen now, Jim? Uh, yes, I can, Keith. I'm, by the way, y'all, I'm trying to answer questions in the background um, as much as I can. Keep them coming. Um, we'll get all of them afterwards if we don't get to everything, but I'll try to lob things into Keith along the way as well. So, thank you very much for all the questions. So, this, this is a cluster that I set up um, earlier today. Um, it's nine Cockroach DB nodes um, plus an additional worker node in each region. Um, which you're not going to see in here because it's they didn't I didn't have them join the database cluster. Um, on that worker node, I'm running a load balancer and a load generator. So we're generating a load in each of these regions. The app that we're running is a simulated ride sharing app that that we call Mover. Um, a lot of our tutorials on the website use this app. Um, so this is just a scripted version of a of a, a tutorial, uh, the geo partitioned replicas tutorial. In our, on our website if you wanted to go through and, and do this yourself. So um, right now we're running, the performance isn't great, it's running like 500 milliseconds per, per query. I haven't done anything to the database to, to make it fast. Uh, we're running about 650 transactions per second across the, the nine nodes, okay? So, um, so what I'm gonna do first is, is I'm gonna demonstrate that the database continues to operate um, when I kill a node. So I'm about, I just killed one of the nodes in the US East region. Um, so I think we'll be able to see it here in a second or two. Um, we have a suspect node. So US East 1C just went down. Um, I'm gonna show that how the database, um, we, we're gonna have a bit of a performance blip, of course, but then the, the remaining nodes are gonna kind of take over those, those transactions as they go forward. Um, there was a question about cap theorem, right? So you can't guarantee consistency, guarantee availability, and be partition tolerant 
all at the same time. And, and that's still mathematically true. What, what we do is because we distribute and use the data and use consensus, we can design the database to survive certain failure scenarios. So in this case, I, um, the, the database, I just demonstrated it surviving a node failure. I could have taken out an entire region as well. And the other two remaining regions were, would be able to continue to, to process data for the database. Um, if we were to lose two of the three regions though, and I lost a quorum for my ranges, then there would be data unavailability. So, so it's not like we um, uh, completely disproved CAP theorem. Um, instead, we're, we're working around those limitations to try to um, kind of make the, the, the database um, be able to survive the types of failures we need to be able to survive. Now, I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna let that, uh, that node that I failed come back up. Um, it's gonna take a little bit of time. Once it does, you'll see that this under replicated ranges count that you're seeing on my screen right now um, will go back to zero. So the, the node has restarted and um, now we have caught the under replicated ranges up. And so the database is fully healthy. Um, What's great about all of this is with the exception of that uh, a dip where we were reelecting the, the leaders for certain um, sections of the data, which meant that um, we were holding some queries, the database was completely self-healing. And it actually self-healed to the original performance metrics um, with, um, before I even restarted the new node, okay? So, but we haven't done any performance optimization and quite frankly, you know, a P99 latency of, you know, in the half a second range is not great for most user facing apps. Yep. Hey, can I just, before you get into the performance thing, can I just ask, there was actually one question that was kind of interesting in this whole thing. Um, and it's, it's, it's applicable to where you're at right now. And so look at, we just so showed survival that one node went down, there were still two nodes. There was no real impact to the application. I mean, there was a little bit of a dip um, but queries were still serviced, right? What happens if two or three nodes go down, however? So then, then we would, um, two of three nodes, or so because it's a nine node cluster, remember, I would have to have lost, um, right. it, I could have lost all of my nodes in one region and the database would have continued to operate. If I lost, because I'm only doing a replication factor of three here, if I were to start losing nodes, in uh, across multiple re regions, there's the chance that some sections of the data would not be available. Right. Um, I could manage for that by increasing my replication factor. Right. So if I were to increase my replication factor, in this case to five, I could survive either a full data center loss or any two arbitrary nodes in the cluster, right? Right, right now I can lose, um, I can only lose a node or, or a fault domain, in this case, a data center. Right. Um, it, in the scenario you're describing, if I like up my replication factor to five, then I could lose two arbitrary nodes right. or, or an entire fault domain, right? Or a fault domain plus an additional node. Um, I mean, it, I guess, yeah, I mean, long story short, Keith, it's basically like, well, what do you want to survive and how do you architect a database to survive that? we're gonna give you a couple different knobs and dials to turn to optimize for what you want to do. But I think you have to think about that when you're doing, when you're architecting, you know, the deployment, the topology of this thing, right? Yes. So, um, yeah. so we have a great tool that's linked from our website about kind of what your minimum topology needs to look like and your minimum replication right. factor needs to look like to, um, to design your database to survive certain failure scenarios. Um, right. there, um, you know, there's no magic here. I mean, I, it feels magical because distributed SQL is hard, but the reality is that we're using the same fundamental underpinnings that etcd is using to survive the loss of a master node in Kubernetes. And that's, that's, right. that's the reason why we can do this and we can run in Kubernetes and have a pod be, maybe get restarted on out from under us and still have the database operate the way we expect. Right. So, cool. so what I'm going to do in the background now is I'm going to start optimizing the environment um, for being geo-replicated across three sites. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to partition my tables and indexes. So right now we're using just kind of the default 
which is okay, right? Um, but, you know, as you said earlier, a customer interaction really needs to be 100 milliseconds or less, which means the database probably needs to be, you know, three to five times faster than that at worst case to have consistent kind of real-time performance or seemingly real-time performance for a user-facing application, which is largely what we're focused on. So um, what I'm doing here is I'm altering my tables to make some partitioning decisions, basically to have the leaseholder, which is uh, the, the raft leader. Uh, so technically the raft leader manages write consensus. The leaseholder is the replica, the leading replica that's able to respond to reads without doing a quorum check, okay? Um, so we're configuring the database on the back end right now, um, making some changes to the tables to um, optimize the placement of those things. So we're running a, um, this ride sharing app in three cities, New York, Chicago, and Los Angeles. And so I'm setting the primary rules for each of those cities to, um, to have their primary replicas live in the data center that's closest to those cities. And so what you're gonna see um, is that our query per second count is gonna go up because the database is becoming more efficient and our P99 latency is going to start creeping down here over the next minute or two. Um, and the net effect of that is in, in Mover, I'm gonna go ahead and I'll actually show you um, what we've done here. So I'm gonna go ahead and, and kind of click into to one of these, um, these tables. It's gonna take a second to refresh, hold on a sec. I am having some internet connectivity problems. Yes, you are. There we go. Right. Um, so I apologize for that. So I had a couple of internet connectivity problems there. Let me go ahead and get this going. Here we go. So um, you see we have the, the, the DDL for this table now has a bunch of partitions in it. And we assigned those partitions to different regions. Okay. And what that allows us to do is Basically, this is the DBA setting default rules for how the database should act um, in any kind of given situation. So what we see now is our P99 latency is much better, right? Um, 65 milliseconds as opposed to almost 600 milliseconds. Our transactions per second went up from roughly 650 transactions per second across this cluster to almost 1100. Um, my, my query latency and she's going to continue to improve here over the next, I don't know, couple of minutes. Oh, um, but um, 35 milliseconds is great, but really I want to be sub 10 milliseconds because I want to make sure I have tons of headroom. So now I'm going to do a further enhancement. Um, we have a table in here <coughs> called promo codes, which is really a global table, right? We don't have New York only promo codes, right? So what we're going to do is we're going to create some, um, a global index, which is going to allow us to do fast reads from all of the regions against that table uh, at the cost of a write performance hit. So if I were to add a record to this table, it's um, we're gonna be writing to some uh, additional indexes to make sure that we do fast reads. So our write performance will suffer, but our read performance will get dramatically better. So I'm gonna go ahead and, um, and build those indexes. Um, you can see they're already kind of starting to take effect. Um, and the net effect of this is we're gonna, we're gonna have consistent performance in the database of sub 10 milliseconds for 99 out of 100 of our queries. That means that we could theoretically do 10 database transactions um, within a kind of a real-time app, um, like user, um, interaction if we absolutely had to. That would be a little unusual, right? Usually it's one transaction or maybe two or three. Um, this is going to allow us to, um, to potentially have, you know, 10 or more if we really needed to. Um, now, what you're also going to notice is our, perf our queries per second isn't going to change dramatically with, these, with this change. 
um, because this is only impacting like 2% of the queries in this application. Um, but our P99 latency is going to get, is going to continue to get better until it lands at like, I think it, I think it lands somewhere between four and five milliseconds. If you let it, um, um, once, once the database itself continues to, because the database, as you mentioned earlier, self-optimizes under the covers as well. So once that, that optimization is done, um, then you'll be, um, uh, we're gonna be kind of stick pretty solidly in that three to four millisecond range. You see, we're, we're already kind of getting there right now. Um, so that, that was what I had to show today, Jim. Um, yeah, yeah, and so Keith, Basically, you could then alter the, yeah, I mean, the, the partition as well, and the database is gonna start moving data around, correct? Like, I mean, this was all done in production, correct? Yeah, so uh, there are times when we move data. Um, there more frequently, what we're actually doing is moving the authority to act on that data, okay? So the leaseholder and the RAF leader, those are the, the that's, the authority to um, read and write that range respectively. So what, how the way CockroachDB works is that every node is responsible for some portion of the data in the database, right? Um, so, and in a normally configured environment, you could theoretically break this if you wanted to, but I don't know why you would. Yeah, I mean, um, every node is going to be the leader for some portion of the data follower a follower for other portions of the data and completely uninvolved in certain sections of the data okay. right so so most of what i did here was actually moving the authority to act right if if we set a rule where the authority to act so with those partition schemas let's say i had four data centers here and i decided for any particular you know uh, partition i wanted to move to the, the authority to act to a location that it, we didn't have a, a replica, right? Then the database is going to move the data for you. Yeah. So, so you don't have to man, you don't have to manually load the data in the background to do all this kind of stuff. Right. We will handle that for you, but it's much more likely that we're going to um, move the authority to to act on the data than it is that we're going to move the data. Yeah, um, I got the you. exceptions to be that would be like hot ranges, right? If we take Let's say we're having a lot of transactions across a really small number of ranges, then we might have some things that we would do there. Hey, dude, I, I, we only have four minutes and then we got to cut this thing down well, off. So I just want to make sure I get to like, there were like two other questions and I'm just going to share my screen to have that wrap up slide. So while we're taking QA, people have that. If you can just turn off screen cool. share, that's great. Um, so one of the questions, and it, it came in a couple different ways. Um, how about backup restore uh, and how does that work in CockroachDB? Because it's, it's a unique problem, right? Right, because we're guaranteeing data lives in locations, right? And so how does that work in Cockroach? Yeah, so, um, so the core database, that's the free to use open source database, um, includes uh, backup and restore to a single location. So, you know, let's say you had an S3 bucket in AWS or, you know, or whatnot, you could do, you know, a backup to S3 and all of the nodes would, in your database, would just need to be able to write to sure. that. S3 bucket, um, the enterprise. Um, so we're kind of, we were the entire database is source available. Certain features are licensed as enterprise features that you have to pay Cockroach Labs for. Um, if you have an enterprise license, we also support distributed backup that allows you to have an arbitrary number of nodes back up to an arbitrary number of locations. So let's say for my, you know, simulated use case here where I'm in um, US East, US Central and US West, um, I could theoretically have the nodes in each of those locations back up to a local object store. Um, and then I could, you know, move those replicas around in the background. That's gonna be faster, of course, in a distributed scenario where I'm backing up um, to something that's closer. Um, right. But all of, our all of our backups are distributed. It's just a question of whether or not they're it's a, a many to one distribution or a many to many distribution. Right. And the latter one is what we, we charge customers for. Yeah, and the latter one basically, I mean, it's used in, you know, typically we see customers who are trying to deal with like, you know, compliancy regulations with our database and, you know, like where the, where the backup itself needs to be 
controlled from jurisdictional issues, right? And I think it's, you know, it's one of those more advanced features. So um, another question, Keith, was, um, oh gosh, oh, there was a, there was, a, there were, you guys, there were a lot of really great questions. I think one that's kind of easy to pick off and to go through. What about when you run like a, a query that's hitting all the records, you know, like a sum or a report, you know, because we don't want to range scan the entire database, right? And we're all over the place. Like, how does Cockroach deal with those sort of things, Keith? Yeah, so there are a couple of different strategies for managing. Remember, we only have about one minute, so just so you know. Yeah, so um, that would be a suboptimal query pattern for Cockroach DB. The, the easiest thing to do would be to run what we call an as of system time or a time travel query. Um, that way that that long running kind of aggregate query isn't blocking other transactions. All right. Um, we're serializably isolated. So if you weren't to do that, then, then you potentially have some performance issues. Um, right. There's some right. other mechanisms you can use um, with, uh, with CTEs and, um, and kind of pre-calculated aggregates. Like we could theoretically create an index that included the, some of those pre-calculated index um, um, yeah, but we also, I mean, we also implement vectorized queries, so we can actually do sum of columns pretty easily as well, right? So yeah, so vectorized, um, you know, the vectorized execution engine would right. help the performance there, but we're still going to have to hit all of the yeah. leaders for all of the ranges that host that data. Um, that'll just eliminate some of the, like, overhead of, of the, right. the transactional engine there. That's so. right. That's right. I mean, I mean we've, we've optimized a lot of things. There's also a cost-based optimizer in CockroachDB that deals with like the distributed nature of the data. There's, there's lots of things. I mean, you could actually go and inspect queries and see what's holding things up. We have just barely scratched the surface in this webinar today. Um, you know, CockroachDB is available off our website. I mean, the core version, the free downloadable version is, is available off our site. Just get, get, get CockroachDB. We have a world of resources around Kubernetes in terms of, you know, how well we work with this. We do feel that we are probably the, the best database that is really designed to run on Kubernetes. In fact, Cockroach Cloud, um, which is our managed service of Cockroach DB, runs on Kubernetes. We have deployed thousands of clusters on Cockroach, on, on Kubernetes uh, in Cockroach Cloud. A lot of what we package into the operator is that, 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 that knowledge that we've actually captured. But um, that is really the easiest way to get up and running and, and try this today. We actually give away free clusters for about 30 days. You know, stay tuned for, you know, uh, unlimited free clusters uh, in, in our future. And so there's some really cool stuff coming out of us. So, um, Keith, thank you for that. I want to be respectful of, you know, the Linux Foundation and our time requirements. You and I can sit here and talk about this stuff for days. Um, like I said, I think we just fairly just scratched the surface today. Um, and, and also, there were a lot of questions that came into the, the, the QA. Um, I will get these from, um, from the LF and, and, and get answers out to everybody as much as we can. So, um, Keith, thank you. Thank you. So Appreciate much. it. Yes, thank you both yeah. so much. Thanks, um, Jim. Thanks, Keith. And um, as we mentioned earlier, this recording will be available up on the YouTube um, later today. Um, so thank you all for participating, and uh, we hope you have a great day. Thanks, everybody.